Hi, and welcome back to Psychology with me, Mr. Snyder, and today we are going to talk about uh, quite a broad topic in not so broad terms, social psychology. And your learning targets today are to talk about uh, how the presence of other people can affect performance. Uh, we'll identify why groups and social norms are important. We'll talk about conformity and Solomon Ash's famous study on it. We'll talk about why people conform. Uh, then we're going to talk about Stanley Milgram's studies of obedience. Uh, we'll talk about Philip Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment and um, Darlene Latini's studies on the bystander effect. So people may try harder, take greater risks, or make uh, different decisions when they're with others compared to uh, if they were alone. Why is this so? That is the whole aim of social psychology, is figuring out how groups affect people's behavior. Well, people perform better oftentimes when other people are watching. Uh, this, is, this phenomenon is known as social, social facilitation. So social facilitation is when other people are watching, you perform better. You don't want to embarrass yourself. And that's called evaluation apprehension. You, can, you have a concern about the opinion of others. And so the presence of others, you may want to impress them and improve your performance. Uh, the exact opposite happens when you're a member of a group. Because when you're a member of a group, and we've all been a part of this with uh, school projects, stuff like that, uh, people may slack off and not try as hard, and that's called social loafing. And social loafing occurs because of something called the diffusion of responsibility. Because if you are responsible for a project one, uh, yourself, and it's an individual project, you are 100% responsible for that. But if it's a group project, you're only 25% responsible for it if there's four people. So you feel less responsible for accomplishing the task when the effort is shared among members of a group. And then there is one uh, phenomenon in social psychology called risky shift. And people have found that people take greater risks when they are part of a group rather than individuals acting on their own. And again, this could be due to the di diffusion of responsibility. But people may feel more powerful or less vulnerable when they're part of a group. And this helps to explain prison riots and uh, mobs, attacks, store looting during natural disasters, etc. Uh, people feel more powerful when they're a part of a group. Uh, social norms and groups are very important. And uh, they can explain a lot about our behavior. Because uh, conformity is the least direct social influence on behavior. And it's, it's kind of a request to comply. It's not a order like obedience would be. Uh, conformity is a request to comply, and it could be uh, informal or formal. Uh, conformity is bringing your behavior in line with that of a group. So being accepted by part of a group can help because groups help people satisfy many needs. And so that's why people want to belong to groups, because they help satisfy needs such as belonging, attention, affection, and it's a support network during difficult times. And groups also allow you to accomplish things that you could not accomplish on your own. If you're going to be a part of the group, you need to conform to the group's social norms. And social norms are standards of behavior that the group shares. Um, the famous line from Mean Girls, on Wednesdays we wear pink. That is an explicit social norm that is written down, uh, I assume, somewhere. Or it's explicitly spoken or stated. Implicit norms are unspoken, unwritten rules. So if you're here at a group at school, you call your friends by your first name, by their, by their first name, and you call teachers by your last name, Mr. Snyder. That's not written down any place, but is, it is a social norm of a school group. Now, Ash wanted to test conformity. To what extent will people conform to social norms? And this experiment took place in the 50s. Uh, the procedure was um, 
they took a lot a, a card with four different lines on it and the first line was the base line and they had to indicate which of three additional lines of varying length matched the first line uh, the participants were testing groups maybe five or six people they were varying um, the formulas for this but the, all the group members were Ash's associates. They were confederates of the experiment. And uh, one person was not. The first few times they answer correctly, and so it's not a hard task. Everyone completes it correctly. Then, on like the third trial, they all give the same wrong answer. What's that person who's not in on it going to do? Well, 74% conformed to the wrong answer on at least one trial. And on average, people conformed about a third of the time. And people conformed even when they knew the answer was obviously wrong because they went along with the group because they didn't want to break that social norm of giving that answer. Because like four or five people give the same answer, you're going to look pretty weird if you give a different one. And so this was a great experiment. Why do people conform? Well, there's a cultural influence because conformity is even higher in Asian cultures and Eastern cultures where greater emphasis is placed on the group. Um, there is a need for acceptance from human beings. Uh, some people conform in order to be liked and accepted by others. And that's because people who are different from the group draw negative attention. And you don't want to draw negative attention. You want to be just like everyone else so they'll like you. And uh, the chances of conforming to a group's norms increases as the group grows in size. It, up till about uh, seven or eight is the magic number. You're most likely to conform to that group. As the group gets larger after that, you're less likely to conform. And it's more likely, you're more likely to conform when the choice is unanimous within a group. So now we get to Milgram's obedience studies. And this is the most direct social influence on people's behavior is the power that people in positions of authority hold. So most adults and children's, uh, children's, <laughs> children obey authority figures. So throughout history, um, lots of horrific acts have been carried out because of obedience, such as killing innocent people, like during the Holocaust. Are people who obey an order to commit an immoral act unusual or abnormal? Milgram set out to find the answer to that question. Uh, this is a series of studies in the 60s and 70s. Some people say it's unethical. It definitely is unethical now. Um, but let's take a look. So 40 male volunteers are recruited and told they're investigating the effects that punishment has on memory. So all the volunteers in the experiment are randomly assigned to be a teachers or a teacher and all learners were actually associates of Milgram and although the volunteers believe it's a blind draw that they always get the teacher role the learners supposedly memorized word pairs and the teachers read the words one at a time if the learner failed to provide a matching word then the teacher was to administer an electric shock to the learner for each subsequent wrong answer, the amount of shock would be increased. The equipment did not actually administer the shocks, but the teachers were unaware of this. So nobody's getting hurt here, um, but the teacher thinks that somebody is getting hurt. The teachers were told beforehand that they could quit at any time. However, if they only hesitated, they were urged to keep continuing, um, I believe three times. Uh, the, the researcher offered reassurances to the teacher that the shocks, although they were painful, would not cause any permanent damage. So how far up the scale do you think the people would go with the electric shock? As the learners made errors, the teachers delivered stronger and stronger shocks at 300 volts. The learners started pounding on the wall in pain, although they weren't actually getting hurt. And despite this pounding on the wall in pain, 35 of the 40 participants continued with the experiments. Two thirds of the people continued all the way up the range of voltage to the, um, to the switch that was just marked XXX. Uh, nine participants refused to continue somewhere between the 300 and 450 volt levels. So 
Um, participants continued, although they were later uh, post-interviewed and admitted that they were afraid of the, for the people in receiving the shocks. They thought that they were doing them harm, even though they showed signs of distress. Uh, of distress as the shocks increased, they kept increasing the voltage. And so this has been repeated. This has been repeated in other countries, in America, and other countries even sometimes have higher rates of conformity in this. So what does this all mean? Bottom line, people will obey orders that conflict with their own attitudes, even if it causes them distress to do so. And here are four reasons why people obey. There's a lot of reasons why people obey. Here are the most important ones. Uh, people have been socialized since childhood to obey authority figures, listen to your parents, your teachers, elders, etc. Uh, the foot in the door effect is people have a tendency to give in to major demands once they have given in to minor ones. So if you obey a minor order, you're more likely to obey uh, more major orders as well. Uh, people become confused about their attitudes and beliefs if they're disturbed by what's going on. And buffers, if people are protected from the consequences of their actions, like if they do something and it goes wrong, if the person who told them to do it gets in trouble, then they're more likely to follow orders. Then we come to another unethical experiment, the Stanford Prison Experiment. And the goal here is to see how normal everyday people would respond when put into a prison environment. So the goal here is to see how the situation impacts a person's behavior. They take 24 males uh, who are pre-screened and deemed to be healthy, they don't have any mental disorders or anything like that, and they're randomly assigned a role of a prisoner or a guard. The guards become ruthless they use authoritarian tactics and they subject their prisoners to forms of torture, whereas the uh, prisoners accept the abuse. They become very passive and even depressed, and they harass other prisoners who try to intervene and to suffer breakdowns and have to quit the experiment. Uh, Philip Zimbardo, the experiment organizer playing the role of the superintendent, allowed the abuse to continue. And so even though this was supposed to run two weeks, it's disbanded after six days because he invited his girlfriend in to watch this, who was also a psych student. And his girlfriend goes, what are you doing here? This is immoral. And even he was drawn into the situation and allowed the abuse to continue. So the results are that the situation, not necessarily the personality characteristics of the participants, caused the participants to behave the way they did. They fit into their role because that is what the role told them to do. That is what the situation had them do. And finally, we get to the bystander effect and the chances of altruism. Altruism is the psychological term for the unselfish concern for the welfare of other people. So the chance of this depends on how many other people are present to help. People are less likely to give aid when more and more bystanders are present because it's that diffusion of responsibility. Why should you help when there are other people there to help as well? So John Darley and Bib Latini uh, demonstrated the bystander effect with their classic experiment. Um, it tested what they would do in an emergency with the knowledge others are present, but they can't see or hear them. And um, they put a naive subject in a room and told them they were able to talk with others about normal stress problems with other students who were uh, similarly in isolated rooms. And they wore a headset to talk to others, but actually all the other students were on tape. And one of the stu other students pretends to suffer a seizure and calls for help. They did this in two groups. They did it in a two-person group, a three-person group, and a six-person group. And finally, they set up two more conditions, one with a subject and a real friend of that person as a bystander, and one where six real subjects had prior contact and a brief encounter with who the, per who the perceived victim was. So they knew the person beforehand. What can we learn from this? Uh, basically, the more people there are, the less likely you are to help. And 
And that's all I have for you in social psychology. Again, we're just dipping into it. There's much more we could talk about, but we're going to end it there for the day. And I will see you back in class. Fill out those learning targets, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.